grateful for the opportunity to stand before you this evening and open up the bread of life. And uh, we trust that the Lord will speak to our hearts as he has to mine. And uh, uh, let's uh, take and uh, read the first uh, nine verses of Scripture, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin with the message this evening. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we would pray and ask that this evening, Lord, you would open up the eyes of our understanding, that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Your Lord, that your word might have free course in our midst and be glorified, and Lord, that each of us would truly understand how great you are and how wonderful it is and what you've given to us. I pray you'd help us now. In Jesus' name, amen. When it comes to certain passages of Scripture, each of us will find, <clears throat> excuse me, that there are some that have a special place in our heart's memory simply because of how they speak to us and how they minister to us in a personal way time of need. I have for many years held that 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 is one of my favorite passages of scripture because it reminds me to behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon me, that I should be called a son of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know, we know that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. That passage of Scripture has been one of those go-to passages for me for many, many years. And I continue to go to it and find not only comfort, but encouragement for the way that I live in. But not just the passages themselves that speak to us, but also the people that we meet in the Bible. Because we can relate to their trouble. We can relate to their way of thinking. Or we can uh, relate to how they deal with the things. And usually, I don't know about you, but for me, I can relate to their failures. I think of the Apostle John and his brother James called the Sons of Thunder. I can relate to that because sometimes I feel just like that. And the college students said, Amen, Pastor Grieger. It's also, of course, how the Lord helps me personally through uh, the circumstances of my life as I see how they dealt with the circumstances of their life. Not just to live, not just to exist in the Christian life, but to live in the victory that I own. It's mine. Not because I'm of anything that I've done, not because that I'm good, because he is. I see my shortcomings in them, and so I see how God, in his mercy 
and in his grace helps me to get through things and how to correct myself. You know, it was John and his brother that wanted to call down fire from heaven, but it's the same John that Lord, wrote the Lord's manual on love in 1 John chapter, uh, chapters 1 through 5. It's the same John that uh, uh, leaned upon the breast of Jesus there at the Lord's Last Supper, as we uh, have referred to it at the uh, Pentecost, or no, sorry, not the Pentecost, at, at Passover. It's the same John that wrote the book of Revelation. And so, if God can change him, there's hope for me. And there's hope for you, amen? And when I see my shortcomings, I can learn by what they did and by what they have, what I also have in the same salvation that I possess that they do. I have the same Lord. I have the same salvation. I have the scriptures that help me. I want to ask you this evening, do you have those certain passages of scripture that when you read them, they affect you again and again and again the same way. First John chapter three does that to me, but First Peter chapter one is another of those passages of scripture that helped me time and again. You'd say, well, how? Well, I wanna to explain to you how tonight because I think it can help you as well. Not only can I relate to James and John, the sons of thunder, but I can also relate to Peter in so many ways, particular uh, particularly in his humanity. And here in our text passage of Scripture is where I've often resorted to because of my humanity, and I see his humanity, but I also see in his humanity what he has gained by his walk with the Lord. This passage has a special place in my heart's memory because of the help it has given me time and time again. I remember the first time that I read this passage of Scripture, and I've referred to this in other sermons that I preach, as well as in Bible doctrine classes. But I remember a particular time when we lived uh, in, uh, in Morden at the trailer court. I don't know how long we'd been being married, but we'd only been in church for a few years. And uh, uh, I don't know about you, but I sometimes have gone through times of a little discouragement, a little bit of dismay, and, and one time in particular, as I was still doing my devotions, I, I didn't quit doing my devotions because I was discouraged. I wanted to do more because I knew that I needed help. And I got to this passage of Scripture and I read verses 1 to 5. And then I did what chapter 1 verse 8 says. And it says, uh, with, uh, I rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory because of what I read in verses 3 through 5. Verses 3 through 5 tell us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I read five verses that morning in my devotions. I jumped up and I rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory because the Lord just said, Gary, you're saved. What more do you need? Quit being discouraged for no reason. Look at what you have. And so my, the title of my message tonight is simply, Do You Know What You Have? Because it's when you know what you have that your life really changes. It's not changed by the things we do or the things that we don't do. We do the things that we should do and we do not do the things that we shouldn't do because of what we have and who we have it in. Amen, Brother Keen. I can relate to Peter in so many ways. Have you ever read Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and the account of uh, 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 Peter's denial? And there's Peter in the last denial, and he hears the cock crow, and he looks over at Jesus, and he sees him eye to eye, face to face. 
and he's reminded about his failure. And he goes out and weeps bitterly. And I can think of many times when I have thought about my failures to the Lord and how, just like Peter, I was given the grace and the mercy to get back up and go forward because of what I have and who I have it in. These words that we read here in these verses of Scripture are not just the words of a man who took to writing down some thoughts that he had to pass on what he knew. These are the words of God that he's given to us, to the man and through the man that he was working in, and praise God, he's still working on me. I shared this in my Sunday school class this last Sunday, and I shared it in chapel last night as well, but I took it to heart because it's so very true. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said this in a sermon that I was listening to, and he, this is a paraphrase. I, I didn't have time to write it all down, but it was a paraphrase of what he said in his, in his sermon. And he said, very little of the Bible speaks about salvation and how to be saved. But what it does say, it says with clarity. But he said, most of the Bible speaks of how to live the Christian life after one is saved. And I got to thinking about that and I thought about how true that really is. And I thought about this as well, that even though the Bible speaks very clearly about salvation, all that it says about the Christian life, it also speaks with great clarity for those who are seeking and for those who are willing to hear what the Lord wants to say to them. Praise God. We have much to learn from him, don't we? Now, we cannot gain full understanding of this text this evening, but let's get what we can. Amen? Let's think on what we have. Excuse me. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, for us, this is a motivation to that which keeps our lives in focus on simple and right. Verses 10 to 17 of this passage really help us to understand that that's what Peter's talking about. He's making the point of what we have so that when we live the Christian life, we'll know how to react and what to do. When we focus on what is simple and what is right, our life will be simple and it'll be right as well. It won't be that we won't understand the deeper things of God as we grow and as we study, because we will, but those things always go back to the anchor of what's simple and what's right in the Christian life. And over and over again, the scriptures teach us how to live for the Lord. Our eyes will then, when we look at what is simple and what is right, will be kept on Christ because of what we have in him, not because of what we don't have. Because we have so much more in him. Ask yourself, do I really know what I have? I was looking for some illustrations about this and I came across this, I thought this was great. In 2006, a man by the name of Dave Tracht was working on his deceased father's house. When he discovered a false wall, and so being inquisitive as all of us would be, he opened up that wall and he began to look for what was behind it. And behind that wall, he found an original Norman Rockwell painting. A painting was called Breaking Home Ties, and it's simply a picture of a father and son who seem to be either at a bus stop or at a train station, and the father's, uh, they're, they're sitting on the running board of their Ford Model A, and uh, uh, they're sitting there, and the boy is up like this looking for the train, and the dad is just kind of hunched over waiting for the train too. 
And it's just a, a, a simple painting, but it was in a, a, a Norman Rockwell painting. This man, Dave Trax's father, was a cartoonist. And what he had done was, in 1960, he bought the original for $900. And he hid it behind a wall to hide it from his wife, whom he was going through a divorce with. And he hid it back there, but before he did that, being an artist, he painted a copy of it. And it was so good that it was eventually sold and it was placed in the Norman Rockwell Museum as the original. Dave found the original back behind there and when it was proved that it was indeed the Norman Rockwell original, Dave sold it at auction for $15.7 million. He didn't know what he had. And so I looked for another story. I don't know what the year was, but in Toulouse, France, a family was cleaning out the attic of an old house that they had had in their, their family for centuries. And up in the attic, they began to clean up the, uh, the, the debris, and they found a, uh, an old mattress, and they lifted up the mattress, and below the mattress was a, a, a painting. And it turned out that painting was from the Renaissance. I don't know how old that means it is, but it just means it was old. And when, he, when they took that painting to the auction house for verification, it was sold for $170 million. They didn't know what they had. They had no idea what was there. You know, that wall covered that painting. That mattress covered uh, that painting until it was removed. And many times, Christians fail to realize the value of what they really have in their salvation in Christ because they don't take the time to look. And all too often, I'm preaching to myself, folks, all too often, we take Christ for granted. We don't realize what we have in the Savior. And every time I read 1 Peter chapter 1, I would say 90% of the time that I read 1 Peter chapter 1, I read it with tears. Because of the truth that God brought home to my heart but what I possess in him. Peter tells us what the Holy Spirit gave him to write so that the readers of his day and ours in our day would know that we would realize what we have. So I ask you, do you realize, do you know, do you understand what we have in Christ I want to take a look at this passage of Scripture this evening and the time that we have, and I want to bring out some of the things that have really helped me and spoken to me, and, 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 and I, I trust and pray that they will to you as well. Who are we? Well, let's look at who we are. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. First and foremost, you and I, as the children of God, are strangers. Pastor Drieger, we always, always knew you were a little strange. We're strangers. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We are strangers here in this place. That word strangers means pilgrims, sojourners. These believing Jews were no longer part of their former Judaism. Hebrews, yes. But no longer did they follow what they had as Jews to be saved. Now they followed Christ who saved them. They were strangers. And yes, they were also strangers in Asia Minor because of their nationality. But first and foremost, I think we make the application to our lives today to understand who we are. We are strangers. 
They no longer look to the sacrifices. They no longer look to the synagogues. They no longer look to the law as what would save them. They look to the word that was made flesh. They look to he who had filled, fulfilled every law that there was in his person. It is most likely that these were the men that we find in Acts chapter 2 that came there at Pentecost and heard Peter preach that message and were saved and then went back after they followed the Lord in believers' baptism and began to learn and continued steadfastly in all the things that, that the disciples had taught them and were teaching them. As we read in Acts chapter 2, these were the men who brought the gospel to Asia Minor and built churches. These were the, the men, the, the believers that God used in that second generation, if you will, from the disciples. They were strangers. They were no longer who they were and what they were before they were saved. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 21 tells us, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become now. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm a stranger in this world. And the world is strange to me the more I walk with him and learn to love him. Their identity changed that day as they took the gospel of Jesus Christ back with them to their homes in Asia Minor. And as Christians, folks, we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. Not only were they strangers, they were also the elect. They were elect. Now, there's not a Calvinist bone in my body. Because Calvinism is heresy. I don't follow a religion named after a man. I follow a religion named after a savior. I follow a religion that is based in the Bible, not based in some man's philosophies or misinterpretation of the Bible. Are we the elect? We are the elect when we get saved. Predestination has to do with where I'm going, where he predestinated me for. These men, he calls them here in verse 2, he says, elect. He calls who they are. They're strangers scattered throughout the, the, the Asia Minor there. And he said, you're elect. How are they elect? They're elect according to the foreknowledge of God. You know, I don't know what you're going to do tomorrow, but I know someone who does. His foreknowledge is an amazing thing. We look back at history and we see what took place and we can look back to earlier in this day and we can think about the things that we did. We can plan on what we're gonna do tomorrow, but James covers that. <laughs> if it's the will of God, we'll do this, that, or the other. <clears throat> but as the elect, God foreknew that in July of 1974, and he knew this before the foundation of the world, he knew it in eternity past because he knows all things from all time because he is omniscient. He knows it all. Not like some of us who think we know it all, amen? But he knows it all, and in his foreknowledge, he knew exactly who would hear the gospel and who would respond to it with a yes and who would respond to it with a no. He didn't foreordain that I should, like Calvinism would teach. He didn't say, James, sorry, you can do what you want, but you're going to hell. You're elected to it. That's not the election of the Bible. The Jews were the chosen people of God. And now, all believers make up the body of Christ and the body of Christ is also his bride. And that bride is the bride that he has chosen. Well, how does he choose his bride? Does he do it the same way we do? We see a pretty girl. It's her. No, that's what Samson did. And we know where his life ended up. Jesus chooses 
his bride by giving an invitation. And to all those who say yes, they're elect, they're chosen. As soon as anyone trusts Christ as their Savior, back here and today and in the future, as soon as they trust Him, they become a member of the elect. Everyone who believes and everyone who receives Jesus Christ as their Savior from death enters into that election. They are chosen. God foreknew who would respond to that offer of salvation from the wages of sin with that yes or no. And those who respond with a yes enter into that election by faith through sanctification of the Spirit. That word through, and I'm not a a, a great uh, grammarian, everybody knows that, I don't hide it, I don't try to make any bones about it, but that word through is a preposition. You didn't know I knew that much. But it's a preposition. And what a preposition does is identifies how something works. And so this election comes by faith through sanctification, that's a setting apart of the Spirit. I want us to take our Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now my Bible doctrine students from this last semester will know exactly where I'm going. And maybe some others. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read it instead of quoting it. In verse 12, Paul writes, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made, uh, been all made to drink into one spirit. When you got saved, when you trusted Christ, you heard the gospel, and you trusted Jesus Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, as your personal savior, something spiritual took place that you didn't see, but you experienced. You didn't realize what you experienced, but it happened nonetheless because 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 tells us that it did. The moment that you said yes, the Holy Spirit of God took you and he delivered you from this world of darkness and placed you into his kingdom of light and he baptized you. He immersed you into the body of Christ. He set you apart. He sanctified you into his body. He placed you there. Why? Because he bought you with a price. He paid for your salvation with his life's blood. And so being set apart, being set of, sanctified of God's Holy Spirit goes on from there. That's how we become the elect. When we trust Christ as our Savior, we are chosen. He takes and he puts us over here into his marvelous kingdom of light. And there we are. Being set apart, we are set apart unto something. Notice in verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. And here's another preposition. Unto, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 tells us that God has predestinated us to be conformed into the image of his Son. That's the image that we were created with or in in Genesis chapter 1. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And that's exactly what he did. In Genesis 3, we fell from that image. We fell from that likeness. And then all we were, were fleshly and dead spiritually. And we needed that new birth. 
And in giving us that new birth, he sanctified us, set us apart unto obedience. <clears throat> obedience to the things in the scripture, the scriptures that tell us how to live the Christian life, are there to help us to be like him. Not to be like ourselves. I don't know about you, but I've always been the only one that's impre been impressed with me. But everybody should be impressed with Christ. And I've been sanctified, I've been set apart unto that. That's the, the path, that's the, that, that, that word unto expresses motion towards. Like, I'm not like Christ fully, but I'm more than I was before I was saved. And I was sanctified unto obedience, unto obedience. Election looks at the place from which we are taken, sin in the world, Predestination looks at the place that we are going. I've been elect, I've been chosen because I said yes. And I was placed into Christ and now I've been predestined to go to heaven to be with him. That's part of who I am as the elect. The sprinkling of the blood of Christ speaks of course, to that which covers our sin, but it also speaks to the covenant that God made with his people in Exodus chapter 24. In Exodus chapter 24, you can read, read that uh, uh, another time if you would, but in Exodus chapter 24, uh, Moses speaks to the people about all the words that God has spoken to them. And that's a passage that we actually memorized here in our church uh, a few years ago uh, when uh, the, the, the theme was obedience and all that thou hast said we will do. And after they proclaimed that, they had taken, and, and, uh, taken those sacrificial animals and they caught half the blood in one basin and half the blood in another. And that half that blood was offered as a sacrifice upon the altar. But the other half of that blood, Moses took after he had read the covenant that God had made with his people. And that covenant was sealed between God and his people by the sprinkling of the blood. And he took that blood and he sprinkled it on the people. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The deal's been made and it's been sealed. We are sealed, Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians, unto the day of redemption by the blood of Christ. That sprinkling of the blood in the Old Testament certified the covenant and the seal of the Holy Spirit of God uh, taking that blood and applying it to us and sprinkling, sprinkling us with it, if you will, seals us, seals us. Do you realize what you have? Do you realize who you are? Folks, it's from this rich, exalted position that we as the elect also receive the end address that Peter gives to his readers in verse two when he says, grace unto you and peace. But he doesn't just say grace unto you and peace. He says, be multiplied. Be multiplied. One might ask, how? How is it multiplied? Folks, it's pretty simple. We just read on. We read on and we understand that through a deeper realization of what our position is in what follows after this and the wonder of it all, we see that grace and peace are multiplied unto us. The more I realize what I have and who I'm in, the greater I realize is grace and the more peace I have in my life as a believer. Notice with me, not only who we are, 
but what we possess. In verses 3 to 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a dead hope. It's not what it says, is it? Unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What a wonder of what we possess. Here in verse number three, Peter begins by blessing God. And this word blessing also means praise God. He says, praise the Lord. Praise God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he tells us why. And all these things add up to help us to understand that grace and peace are multiplied to us. Not just given in small measure. God giveth more grace, more grace, and more grace. What do we possess that Peter praises the Lord for? Well, first of all, he praises him for sonship. Think of it. These Jews now had a better relationship to God than ever before. Well, Pastor Peter, they were, they were the Jews, they were cho the chosen people. Yeah, now they're part of the bride of Christ. They no longer found God unapproachable like the God of their fathers did. But the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he uses a personal a preposition that is plural. He says, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just mine. He's ours. And he points out to these Jewish believers of who they are and what they have. Their relationship as sons far exceeded what they had before. And so does ours, amen. Amen. They became sons of God by faith in God the Son. Not out of God's mercy, but according to it. There's a difference. According to the abundance of his mercy, God doesn't have just a little bit. He's got more than we could ever need. The abundant, deep mercy of God knows no depth that it cannot reach with the exception of unbelief. I am so grateful that somebody told me about Jesus. I am so grateful that somebody took the Bible and showed me how to be saved. Did I understand all the details of what took place the day I got saved in July of 1974? Nope. Still don't understand it all. But I sure do know it. Because his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm his child. Not only does he bear witness that I'm his child, he bears witness of his abundant mercy to me. It knows no depth but the limit of unbelief. We also notice here that it was again. He hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. It was again by that second birth that Peter heard Jesus preach about and confess Jesus to have the words of life which alone give a lively hope. He's not talking about a hope that's just hopeful. He's talking about a no-so hope. He's talking about having an understanding of what he has and how it affected and changed his life for God and for good. Wasn't that kind of hope that no uh, unbeliever has? In 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul talks about those 
who, who uh, 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 have no hope, those who are without Christ, those who sorrow because they have no hope. That hope of seeing Jesus and being like him was the hope that he's talking about. And its liveliness is a result of the resurrection of the one who defeated death and hopelessness. Our world is hopeless because it's defeated. Not only was he the elect and not only did he have sonship, as sons he had an inheritance. Think about it for a moment. These scattered Christian Jews had an inheritance that they might not have realized. Everything that the Jews hoped for as far as an inheritance was connected to them being the chosen people of God and the land that God gave them. But they didn't have that. They didn't have the assurance of it because they were scattered in many cases because of their rebellion. And their land was occupied by the world because they forfeited it. As God's chosen people, their disobedience had cost them their place and their land, but in Christ, these believers, these Hebrew Christians, had a better inheritance than they'd ever had before. It was an inheritance that was incorruptible. It was undefiled. It fadeth not away. It's reserved in heaven for them. And folks, what they have, we have. How much better, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 and 40 tells us that they had a better inheritance now than what they had before. And then in verse 1 of chapter 12, Paul goes on to say, wherefore, and in verse 2, looking unto Jesus. How much better? Well, it was incorruptible. It was not liable to decay. Most of you won't remember this. My wife will. Sandy may. Pastor Sullivan does. I've talked about it before, but we had a 1986 Chevy Cavalier. It was white for the most part. The rest of it was kind of a rust color. It was corrupting. Pastor Sullivan and I took that car down to Minneapolis. It got 44 miles to the gallon. Rust and all. That car was corrupting. It was falling apart. Our salvation, our inheritance is not like that. It's not liable to decay, it's immortal. It's undefiled. It's free from all and anything that could possibly corrupt it. You know, we have money in the bank. We have an inheritance we're looking for. But you know, with a failure of a bank, that could all be gone in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, but not our inheritance. It's incorruptible, it's undefiled, it's unfading, that means it's per perpetual. It will never be depleted by time or by use. What a wonder what God has given to us, what we possess. Not only that, it's reserved. What had been lost in disobedience could not be lost in Christ. And their place in glory with God was secure because it was reserved. And we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Being kept by the power of God through faith once placed in him, and that salvation's fullness is ready to be revealed to us. I am grateful that God holds on to my salvation. I don't hold it. It's mine. I possess it. 
but I don't hold on to it. I'm kept by the power of God. We often, in our area, with our heritage, we have many who believe that you can't know or you can lose it if you have it. In fact, I had a college student a little while ago talking to somebody and asking about it. And I was just meditating and looking at this passage of Scripture uh, yet again. And I pointed them. It says right here that we don't keep our own salvation. God does. God keeps it. If I had a $10 bill and I gave it to Gerhard, and I said, Gerhard, I want you to hold this for me. And Gerhard put that in his wallet and he said, I'm holding this for Pastor Drieger. Can I lose it? I can't lose it. Gerhard's not God. But I trust Gerhard that he wouldn't misappropriate or spend it or lose it. God can't lose anything. What was it that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17? Of all thou hast given me, I have lost none. Lost none. The possession of my salvation, it is my salvation. It's God's gift to me, but there's no way I can lose what I don't hold on to. He holds it. He holds it. I am kept by his power and am already in his possession according to John chapter 10 and Ephesians chapter 2. My eternal salvation is ready even though I may not be ready for the place that he has for me. But I know it's there. He tells us what we have. He tells us who we are. But he also tells us what's before us. In verse 6, he tells us in verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. When? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy, <clears throat> unspeakable and full of glory. Listen. When we understand who we are and what we have, we'll be prepared for what's before us. Not by anything that we've done or anything that we could do, but of him who holds us in his hand. of our Savior. Great rejoicing lies in those who focus on He who they are in and what they have in Him. Though in their lives they may face many trials and temptations which may bring heaviness. But the purpose of those trials and temptations of course is not to harm us, it's to help us. Those trials, those temptations that Peter speaks about here, the trying of our faith, he says, is much more precious than of gold that perishes. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, he tells us, he reminds us that this world is going to melt with great fervency of heat. But that heat, that fire that we experience in day-to-day -day life Incidentally, that Paul called our light affliction helps to make us better. Helps us to understand when we're going through it, who's there to help us? The fire of adversity strengthens our faith just like fire strengthens steel. Their faith 
and their faithfulness would be tested. Their integrity to the truth of the Word of God, their virtue to the things of God, their constancy to Christ would be put through the fire of adversity for their faith. You know, you never know how strong you are until you're tested. I know that I cannot bench press 300 pounds. I might be doing good to bench press 100. But every test, every trial, every problem that I go through with Christ strengthens me, makes me better. Not me better, but him better in me. Amen? And Paul says, this is of much greater value than any gold that will one day burn. How is grace and peace multiplied? It's through understanding who we are, and what we have, and who's going to go with us through life's problems. And that should encourage us with joy unspeakable and full of grace.